Welcome back to our final lecture on kinetics and equilibrium. And today we're going to be talking about a thing called the law of chemical equilibrium. Now, our goals for today. First, we're going to figure out how the equilibrium constant, which is represented by the symbol KEQ, is calculated. How do we come up with this number, this KEQ number? Second, we're going to talk about what a large KEQ value means for our equilibrium, and what does a small KEQ value mean? We can look at this KEQ value, and we can tell something about our equilibrium. And then later on, we're going to be studying a special version of the equilibrium constant, KEQ, which is called KSP. So we're going to have to know what KSP actually refers to. And again, what does a large KSP value mean for our substance, and what does a small KSP value mean for our substance? So let's take a look at the law of chemical equilibrium. Here's what you guys already know about equilibrium. Once you have a system at equilibrium, the amount of reactants and the amount of products doesn't actually change. Concentration of reactants and concentration of products remains constant. So if you come back in like an hour later, you still have the same amount of reactants and products, and some products have turned into reactants, but some reactants have turned into products, so all the numbers, all the concentrations are remaining constant. But we also know that you can add or remove reactants or products or play around with temperature and pressure to change an equilibrium to force it to shift towards the reactants or the products. The question is, how far does it shift when you cause an equilibrium to shift? As it turns out, the ratio between the products and the reactants never changes. So in other words, if the equilibrium shifts towards products, it's going to shift until it gets back to the same product-reactant ratio. If it shifts towards reactants, again, it's going to shift just far enough to maintain the product-reactant ratio. So to understand how this works, we're going to take a look at a little fake reaction. That is, R is in equilibrium with 3P. Now, let's see, you get it, reactants, products. There's going to be one reactant for every three products. And what we're going to do is we're going to start adding and uh, adding reactants and watching how the equilibrium shifts. So for our first trial, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by adding two reactant molecules. So here we go. We've got our two reactant molecules. And if we wait just long enough, what we're going to see is, oh, look, there you go. Some of the prod some of the reactants turned into the products. And then we come back a little while later and look. That turned back into reactants, those turned into products, but whether it's this way or this way, and then it bounces here, and then it bounces there, we always have the same ratio of reactants to products. For every reactant, we have three products. For every reactant, we have three products. So let's jot that down. If we had two reactants, what eventually happens is we have an equilibrium where we have one reactant and three products. Now, the second thing we're going to do is to our, our original amount, to this 1 and 3, what we're going to do is we're going to add two more reactants. So here we are with our reactants and our products. And what we're going to do is we're going to add two more reactant molecules. Now, equilibrium says if you add more reactants, it should shift over to products. But how far does it shift? That's what we're looking at today. You can see what happens is, what happens, one of the reactant molecules turned into products. So now we have this 1, 2 to 6 ratio. And it'll go back and forth. There we go, 2 to 6, 2 to 6, 2 to 6. They're changing, but since they're changing both in the same rate, equilibrium, we always have this 2 to 6 ratio. So now let's, now let's add that in. When we add two more, we end up with a 2 to 6 ratio. So now we're going to add two more reactant molecules. So here we have our two reactants and our six products. And now we're going to be adding even more reactants. And now it should shift back over to products. How much? To get back to the same ratio we saw before. Now we've got a three to nine ratio. And this will go back and forth. Some of the reactants changing into products, some of the products changing into reactants, but always maintaining that same ratio. So after we added two more, we had a 3 to 9 ratio. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to add four more reactants to this. 
So here we are with a 3 to 9 ratio, and we're going to add 1, 2, 3, 4. And again, too many reactants, shift to the product side. How far is it going to shift? That far. Because now we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3, 6, 9, 12, 13, 14, 15. And this equilibrium is now going to stay. So adding more reactants causes the equilibrium to shift to a new point of 5 to 15. And we take a look at these numbers, and you can see what I meant about the ratio of the products to the reactants doesn't change. If you divide the amount of products by the amount of reactants, you always get the same number. Ratio of the products to the ratio of reactants is always the same. It's always going to shift until it gets back to where it originally the original ratio of reactants and products. Here's a website that kind of shows us to us once again. What we're going to be looking at in this case is the equilibrium between hydrogen carbonate or heart carbonic acid, H2CO3, and CO2 and H2O. So these guys turn into this, this guy turns back into these guys. And you can see on the screen here the little red things, those are the H2CO3s, and the green things are the CO2s. So when we start off taking our bottle of soda and sealing it up, we're starting off with a concentration of H2CO3 of 0.0023 molar, and that's 0.068 molar. And if you divide the products, top number, by the reactants, you get the number 30. Now, what happens if I alter the pressure? I'm going to make the pressure much higher. Now when I hit go, it's going to take a second, then it's going to increase the pressure. Watch up here, watch what happens with the concentrations. As we squeeze the bottle to increase the pressure, there it is, the concentrations of the CO2 originally goes up, but then look what happens. Equilibrium reestablishes itself. We lost some of these and some of these started up. Look, the numbers are different. Now it's 0.084 over 0.028, but when you divide them both out, you still get 30. Watch what happens if we change the amount of CO2, increasing the amount of CO2. See, 0.68 over 0.023. But as we squirt more CO2 in here right about now, there you go, concentration of the CO2 goes up. What happens? Equilibrium shifts, and it reestablishes equilibrium right about there. And again, different numbers, 0.099 over 0.0033. It's the same number. No matter what I do to this equilibrium, we always get back to that same ratio number. One more time in graph form. If you take a look at this, see the ratio of the reactants to products, how the ratio the, the reactants is kind of low, the products is kind of high. If we double the amount of the reactants, the equilibrium is going to shift to make more products to get back to the same ratio. So if we double the amount of reactants, watch the shift. Those go down, those go back up, and it maintains relatively the same ratio. It's a little hard to tell without the actual numbers, but still relatively the same ratio of reactants to products. Different amounts, that's over 20, that's over 60, that's not quite up to 20, that's not quite up to 50. But it's the same ratio of reactants to products. So. Now let's talk about the equilibrium constant, what's called the KEQ. The KEQ is a number that represents this ratio of products to reactants. And like we said before, whenever you're comparing reactants and products, whenever you're comparing where we are now to where we are then, we always start with where we are now. We always start with the end. And the end is the products. So we're going to put the concentration of the products on top and the concentration of the reactants underneath just like you saw with the soda bottle. We'll put the molarity of the products here and the molarity of the reactants here, and we'll divide them to get a number. Now, you guys aren't going to be responsible for calculating a KEQ. Somebody's going to do that for you. Your job is to figure out that after they calculate it and they present you with the number, what does the number mean? So somebody else will do this for you, but because it's products over reactants, let's take a look at what this means. Since it's products over reactants, there's two possibilities when you divide one number by another number. First off, if we have more reactants than products at equilibrium, 
So in other words, if we get to a point where there's a little bit of products, but it's mostly reactants, and that's the way it stays, then what you're going to see is this is going to be a big number. That's going to be a small number. So say five molar is our small number of products, but in the same container, the concentration of the reactants is 10 molar. If there's more products than reactants, look what happens to our division. We come up with a number that is less than one. And a number that is less than one, we call that small. KEQ is small. What do you mean small? I mean less than one. So if you ever see an equilibrium constant less than one, point something. It'll never be negative, by the way. There's no negative concentrations. So if it's less than one, point something, means at equilibrium, you have mostly reactants and not a whole lot of products. Now, another way to look at this is how did you get to mostly reactants? You've got the reaction running towards products. You've got the reaction running towards reactants. Well, if you have mostly reactants, that's the reaction that runs better. So in this case, what we say is the reverse reaction is favored because we have more reactants. So the reaction that makes the reactants runs better than the reaction that makes the products. Okay, what if the opposite is true? What if, like with our soda container, what if we have more products and less reactants? Well, you kind of saw what happens there already in our our, um, very, our, our original demonstration with the R molecules and the P molecules, we always had more P molecules than R molecules. Well, if the top number is going to be bigger than the bottom number, say like this, 100 molar product but only 10 molar reactant, we are going to get an equilibrium constant that is larger than 1. So we call this big. What do you mean big? I mean larger than 1. That's what big is. So an equilibrium constant that is larger than one means you have more products than you do reactants. And again, here we are back at our soda container where we change the amount of CO2, where the concentration of the products, see, the products are the CO2 and the H2O. So the concentration of the products is greater than the concentration of the reactants. And if you look at the container, there's more green things than there are red things. You have more products than reactants. Your equilibrium constant is larger than 1. And an equilibrium constant that's larger than 1, you have more products. How did you get more products? Because the forward reaction runs better than the reverse reaction. The forward reaction makes more products than the reverse reaction. Okay? Small KEQs. Mostly reactants, reverse reaction runs better. Big KEQs, more product, the forward reaction runs better. So here's one way in which you can get tested on this. Here's an equilibrium. H2O is an equilibrium of H3O plus plus OH minus. And they're going back and forth. The H3O and OH minus are bumping together to make water molecules. The waters are changing into the hydronium and hydroxides. Well, the equilibrium constant for this particular reaction is 1 times 10 to the minus 14. Now that you know that number, you should be able to tell me what's bigger, the amount of water or the amount of hydroxides. Well, take a look at that number, 1 times 10 to the minus 14. If you wrote that out in standard notation, it would look like this. 1 times 10 to the minus 14 is 0. Point blah, 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 whole lot of zeros and then a 1 and a 4. That number is obviously way smaller than 1. Well, we know that a small equilibrium constant means we have more reactants and only a little bit of products. So in this case, because the number is so incredibly tiny, we have almost all H2O and just a little bit of this floating around. Since the KEQ is less than 1, we have more reactants. So the concentration of water is much, much higher the concentration of the hydroxides in this case. Okay, so right now you also have this other sheet that has got some extra information on there for you. And if you look towards the bottom of this extra reference table, you'll see a bunch of reactions with equilibrium constants listed on them. Using that sheet, 
I want you to tell me which one is favored, the forward or the reverse reaction. Remember, if it's a big equilibrium constant, we have more products in the forward reaction. If it's a small equilibrium constant, we have more reactants and the reverse reaction runs better. So, using the chart, that extra reference table that you just got handed, tell me, for the first reaction, the silver ammonium complex split apart, which reaction is favored, forward or reverse? Well, if you look at the chart, you find that the equilibrium constant for this particular reaction is 8.9 times 10 to the minus 8. 10 to the minus 8 means it's 0 point, a whole bunch of zeros. That means it's smaller than 1. Smaller than 1, mostly reactants, mostly reverse reaction is favored. Now, on the chart, let's take a look at N2 plus 3H2 gives you 2NH3. This equilibrium constant is actually 6.7 times 10 to the fifth. Positive number here means it's much bigger than 1. This is about uh, somewhere in the area of 670,000. That's what 6.7 times 10 to the 5 is. So that's a really big number. That's way bigger than 1. Way bigger than 1 means you have mostly products, which means the forward reaction ran best. Now, how do you alter the equilibrium constant of a number? You guys have seen that if we change the concentration, and we did that soda thing, when we changed the concentration, we still got that ratio of 30. When we added or removed reactants and products, we added more CO2, and we got that same number, we got that 30. So changing pressure, changing concentrations is not going to change the ratio. But there is one more thing that we haven't talked about, one more stress that we haven't talked about, which can alter this equilibrium number. Changing the concentrations. Remember, if you add more reactants or products to one side, equilibrium shifts over and it keeps shifting to get back to that same ratio. But the one thing we haven't mentioned was temperature. The only thing that can change this number right here, 6.7 times to the fifth, is changing the temperature. Here we go. We're back to our soda bottle. Remember, we change this, we change that. We always get this ratio of 30. My equilibrium constant is always 30. More products, less reactants. But watch what happens if I alter temperature. Let's heat this up to a higher temperature. And then we'll run it. Watch our concentrations. Here we are. We apply the temperature. The concentration of the CO2 goes down, and then equilibrium shifts to deal with it. But look what happens. Now our equilibrium constant is 40. So changing the temperature actually changed the KEQ value. Nothing else does. Changing the amount of CO2, changing the pressure, that always got us 30. Only by changing temperature will we change this number. Here's another problem for you. Let's take a look at the equilibrium of hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas is making water. Yes, there should be two water molecules there, but we're just following molecules right now. We're not worried about this thing being balanced. Look what we've got here. What do we appear to have more of? Reactants or products? If you kind of go through, it looks like Products, you've got one, two, three, four, five. You pick any reactant, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We've got a lot more reactants than we do products, a lot more oxygens than water, a lot more hydrogens than water. So we've got a lot of these guys and not a lot of these guys. What does that mean? Well, if you divide the amount of these guys by this bigger amount of these guys, you should have a number that's less than one. So if your two choices was this equilibrium constant, and two choices were that equilibrium constant and that equilibrium constant, since we have mostly reactants, you should pick the small 6.3 times 10 to the minus 12, not the number that's bigger than one, 8.7 times 10 to the fourth. Final thing we're going to talk about is a thing called KSP. Now, KEQ is a very general term. There's lots of different types of equilibrium constants. 
there's um, there's a, a KSP for um, uh, lots of different chemical reactions. There's KSPs for uh, neutralization. There's KSPs for all sorts of different types of chemical reactions. There's KAs. There's KBs. These are all forms of KEQ. The one we're going to focus on is a form of KSP. It follows the same rules as KEQ, but because it's a special type of reaction, it means something a little special. KSP stands for solubility product constant. So we're talking about solubility. We're talking about how well it dissolves in solution. For anything that you put in water and try to dissolve it, you can write the reaction the same way. You can write it like this. Here's our chemical as a solid. This is the stuff sitting on the bottom that didn't dissolve. And that's in equilibrium with the stuff that did dissolve. And as we talked about earlier, the stuff that's floating around in solution, sometimes this will fall out as one of these will go back into solution. So these guys are going back and forth. But we're always going to write it so that the reactant is the stuff that didn't dissolve and the product is the stuff that did dissolve. So following the KEQ rules, we should end up with the chemical dissolved over the chemical that didn't dissolve. See, we put products over reactants just like we did before. So the amount of chemical that dissolved divided by the amount of chemical that didn't dissolve, that's going to give us an equilibrium constant that we're going to refer to as KSP, solubility product constant. It's the exact same thing. It's products over reactants once we're in equilibrium, except because we're talking about stuff dissolving, there's an extra meaning we can have for Let's take a look at the meaning of KSP. Here's a situation with chemical X. And we put chemical X in water. And we stirred it up, and all these little X's down here are not dissolving. All the little X's up here have dissolved. And we are now at equilibrium. So as one of these guys tries to go into solution, one of these guys has to fall out. And we're always going to have this much dissolved and this much undissolved. Well, since KSP is the amount of dissolved over the amount undissolved, we're going to put the smaller number of dissolved stuff on top, 3, and all the stuff that didn't dissolve, we're going to put on the bottom, 11. And you can see that this number comes out to be smaller than 1. This is a small KSP value. But here's another case. It looks like the same chemical, but it's not. It's a totally different type of S. Trust me on this. A different chemical might have this situation. All of these guys dissolved in the water. And just a little tiny bit didn't dissolve in water. And again, we're at equilibrium. As one falls out, one of these is going to go up. So we're going to maintain this 2 to this 21 here. But since it's dissolved over undissolved, since we have lots of dissolved over not a lot undissolved, we end up with a large KSP value, a number bigger than 1. If it's not dissolving, we end up with a small number. If it is dissolving, we end up with a large number. So let's write this down, the meaning of KSP. If you see a large KSP number, a high KSP, what do you mean by a high KSP? I mean a number larger than one. That means lots of the chemical has dissolved in water. And we refer to that type of chemical as soluble. Okay, so if it's a big KSP, if it's a number bigger than one, we call it soluble. See, look, KSP bigger than one, lots of stuff dissolved. If we have a small KSP number, something 5 times 10 to the minus 6, 2 times 10 to the minus 13, a small number, that means a little bit of the chemical is dissolved in water. It's usually such a tiny, tiny amount that it's almost unnoticeable. We refer to note things with a low KSP as being insoluble. Now again, you're saying insoluble doesn't that mean nothing dissolves. No, the term insoluble means we have very, very little dissolving in solution. We don't know of a chemical that has a KSP of zero. You're not going to run across a chemical that has a KSP of zero. There's always going to be a tiny, tiny amount that can make it into the water. But it's usually such an incredibly tiny amount that we don't notice it or that it doesn't really matter. 
So we refer to it as being insoluble. High KSP, soluble. Low KSP, insoluble. Now, let's go back to this, these extra charts that I gave you. Here's an example of the extra charts. Here's the, um, the ammonium and the one we looked at. But we're going to look at this bottom part of chart N right now. And there's a bunch of KSPs. Let's take a look at these compounds. AGBR, 5 to the minus 13. Silver chromate, 1.1 1, 1 .1 to the minus 12. What do you notice about all these chemicals? How could you describe these chemicals? Look at these numbers. Because all of these chemicals have a KSP smaller than 1. These numbers are all smaller than 1. All of these compounds are considered insoluble. But you can see there's different levels of being insoluble. Some are really insoluble, and some are kind of insoluble. So, according to chart M, which is more soluble? Now, silver bromide and zinc carbonate, neither one of them are soluble. But let's look at the numbers. 5 times 10 to the minus 13, tiny, 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 tiny number. Zinc carbonate, 1.4 times 10 to the minus 11. 10 to the minus 11 is a larger number than 5 times 10 to the minus 13. This has got fewer zeros in front of it than this does. So since this is the larger number, zinc carbonate is actually considered more soluble. Neither one of them are actually that soluble. But zinc carbonate is noticeably more soluble than silver bromide. A couple more insoluble things. Calcium sulfate and lead iodide. Take a look at these ones. Calcium sulfate, 9.1 times 10 to the minus 6 small number. Lead iodide, 7.1 times 10 to the minus 9. Who is more soluble? Well, in this case, 10 to the minus 6 is a larger number than 10 to the minus 9. So this can dissolve better than this. Neither one of them dissolve all that great, but calcium sulfate actually dissolves better than lead iodide. And that's it for the law of chemical equilibrium. You should now know, how is the equilibrium constant KEQ calculated? Well, at equilibrium, we put the products divided by the reactants. What does a large KEQ value mean? If the number is bigger than 1, we have more products at equilibrium than reactants, and the forward reaction runs better. If it's a number smaller than 1, small KEQ, that means we have more reactants and not a lot of products in equilibrium. The reverse reaction runs better. Also, KSP, solubility product constant. It's talking about how soluble a substance is. Large KSP, bigger than one, means it's soluble. Small KSP, less than one, means very little of it dissolves and it's referred to as being insoluble. And we also gave you a couple of charts where you can look at equilibrium constants and you can look at KSPs to figure out which reaction runs better and who is more solid. So that's all we've got for today. We've got a worksheet for you guys to work on, answer a bunch of questions. If you've got any questions, please contact me. Good luck.